Welcome to Aston Means Business, SMEs Adapting to COVID-19 Challenges. I'm Steve Dyson, the journalist presenting this regular podcast for Aston Business School. We're focusing on how small businesses are changing their operations to cope with the huge economic disruption caused by the coronavirus pandemic. We're interviewing business leaders who are taking part or who've previously taken part in Aston Centre for Growth's programmes. They're discussing their challenges, sharing their experiences and explaining how they are adapting to the crisis. We're also talking to some of Aston Business School's top academics and other experts, getting their valuable insight, analysis and advice for SMEs. Please bear with us as we're following safe distancing advice by recording the podcasts online. In today's episode, we're going to find out how one business in the hospitality sector has been getting on as the economy starts to reopen. Uh, Joining me to talk about uh, the Whiskey Club's experiences is Mark Hart, a Professor of Small Business and Entrepreneurship at Aston Business School. Hello to you, Mark. Hi, Steve. Good to be talking to you again. Joining me online now is Amy Seaton. She's the founder and owner-operator of the Whiskey Club, based in Birmingham's Jewellery Quarter. Hello to you, Amy. Hi there. Amy, tell us a bit more about the Whiskey Club. Where did it come from? How did it emerge? And when I realise it's all about whiskey, what exactly does it do? Sure. So I started nearly 10 years ago. So I founded um, a company called the Birmingham Whiskey Club. Um, We're now known as just the Whiskey Club um, and grew it over several years. Um, Originally, it was actually part of a wider events company called the Food and Drink Events Company. Um, my background has been in marketing uh, and events, working for large um, corporates in the city. And at that point, I wanted to do something a bit more kind of interesting with my career. Um, I was fairly well connected. Um, and the idea was that I would bring interesting food and drink people into the city um, and form events around them. And to cut a long story short, it was the whiskey that worked. So people, uh, it captured people's imagination. Um, I think it was the kind of the right right place, right time. Um, and I started focusing purely on whiskey. Um, fast forward a few years and I thought, if I'm going to really make a go of this, I need my own space. And at that point, uh, Birmingham didn't have a whiskey bar. So it kind of seemed, I thought I would, <laughs> if somebody else had come in, come into the city and created a whiskey bar, I would have been um, quite annoyed. So I set about um, getting some funding um, and it took me about a year and a half to find the right place. We eventually found uh, a space at the Museum of the Jewellery Quarter. Um, They had a disused part of the museum that we then turned into a whiskey bar, lounge and tasting room. So it is called the Whiskey Club, but you don't need to be a member to be there. And we focus on education around whiskey. So we do lots of tasting events. That's the kind of the, the thing that we're known for. Um, and we opened on Burns Night in 2018. So, yeah, two and a half years. A really exciting venture to be part of. Before the pandemic, what size of business did you have? We had five people, so two part-timers who ran the bar mainly and then three full-timers, including myself. Um, and we were kind of aiming, we were about to to get on to about a £200,000 turnover. And given the nature of the business in the hospitality and events sector, uh, I guess you were fairly badly hit by the lockdown. Yep, we had to straight away, I think it was the 21st of March, um, I remember sitting in the, in the, in the club uh, with my bar manager and I think we had about two people in on that Saturday. And then we were, it was the, uh, the lockdown that happened on the Sunday, so we had to close straight away. Um, so, you know, as, a, as an events type of place we would have you know we're, we're we get a lot of stag do's and things like that so we were having um events cancel left right and center lots of brand led tasting so they all they all had to be postponed so from that point until where we are well early july we i, I would say we kind of shed about 95 percent of our income everybody went on furlough including myself um so that was great i mean obviously there was a little bit of panic in the beginning around uh how long it took to get out but actually you know what well, i can't i can't fault it it's it's one of the reasons why we're still here today um so we had to also uh because of the relationship i have with the museum i wasn't able to get the rateable value business loan and that was um i don't think that was particularly I don't think that was done in a particularly uh, good way because they missed a lot of people like myself. So because I share an address, uh, I therefore don't count as being on the rateable value list. 
Um, and it took a long time to kind of unpick that. Uh, and in the end, they they had a discretionary grant scheme of which I was able to get two and a half K, which I still think is, isn't is enough because just because of, you know, I, I have a, a certain turnover, a certain amount of people to look after. Um, my space is bigger than a lot of other small ventures um, who would have been um, able to get this, the grant, um, because they're on a, you know, a rates list and I'm not. So I think that... I don't think that the government kind of thought that through really. Um, but on the flip side, it did mean that I went out and had a look at other things. Um, the Sybils um, loan, I wasn't eligible for, but the bus- the small business loans um, was actually has been probably the defining element of, of still being here. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that pre-pandemic, there's just no way a bank <laughs> would look at a business like mine in very, very early stages and go, yeah, we'll lend, you know, we'll lend you thousands of pounds. Um, and the fact that they were pushed to lend to people like me meant that I could get quite a bit of money. I think it was, we were allowed up to something like 25% of our turnover. I didn't take the full amount, but the terms have been extremely good. We don't have to pay anything back for a year, no interest on the first year. And then it's a fixed structure of six years, um, at two point five percent, and I just, I just think, where would you get that kind of, um, you know, opportunity? Um, so I think that's, you know, that with the furlough as well has has been the kind of, the reason that I'm still here talking to you now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's a real mixed story, isn't it? I mean, in some ways, it sounds devastating. Ninety five percent plus reduced venues. With that in mind, and the financial status of the business in mind. How did you come back from that? Well, we're still coming back from it. And I think the coming back from it is going to take, um, well, I don't know, I th- you know, a while. But what it's meant, I'm a great believer. I think if you if you own a business and certainly a small business, you have to be highly adaptable, able to pivot. Um, and I thought, I, you know, I could sit on this money uh, and just kind of keep drip feeding it into the business while we got back on our feet and open our doors again. But I don't really believe that that is the kind of business I want. Um, and I just, although that would have been quite secure, um, I thought this is our time to do something with it. Um, and for those who sort of understand the whiskey world, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of ways to invest. So what we've done is, um, we've put a lot of money into a new website, which is great. Something I've wanted to do for a while, but obviously just didn't really have the funds and we're investing in lots of new products. Um, so in the next kind of couple of weeks we're going to launch this website we, we're, we're starting to do collections of mini mini bottles of whiskey which um has had to be very very sort of thought out because of the legislations around scotch and such but the big thing is that we've been able to start buying casks so for those who don't know cask of whiskey obviously uh, whiskey is is matured in a cask and you can actually buy a cask as a long-term investment piece so what we're doing for the first time is able to buy casks and we're going to bottle our own whiskey for our customers and our members now that has been on my mind for well at least since we opened the club as a physical space and now it means that we can actually you know do these really kind of exciting things that really underpin what we're about and give our customers something kind of something unique we're able to kind of put our imagination um back into the business and yes it's still an extremely worrying time and this still might not pay off but it does mean that we can kind of be creative and look at how we can not just be a bar and a tasting room, we can be something much, much broader. What about the original and face-to-face side of the business, the bar, the club, the events and the festival? We've done a couple of trial weekends since the 4th of uh, July. And what's really heartening is that every week we're getting a few more people coming back. People seem to still be confident at spending. And what's really lovely is that people are spending at independence. What I love about Birmingham is that there's a real kind of rallying cry at the moment uh, to, to, you know, to support the smaller business, which is fantastic. And it's not to say, you know, you shouldn't go and support the the larger ones um, as well, because everyone's having a tough time. But I think I can really I can feel feel the love, let's say, of people who want small businesses where they can get to know staff, um, you know, thrive. So there is it feels like the whole city is kind of behind you as well, which is which is lovely. So yeah, we have opened. We're very slowly taking back tasting events. Our inquiries are going up, which is great. Table bookings are going up, which is fantastic. Um, we've got the big festival next year, so we are we are going ahead cautiously. Um, but yeah, I guess you know our online offering is going to kind of underpin the physical stuff. That's that's never going to go. It's it's you know it's the face to face 
chatting and, and drinking will will always be there. It's obvious that the Whiskey Club was hit hard, but you do sound determined to bounce back. How long do you think, Amy, it will take for you to make the company profitable and growing again? Because of these all these new aspects, we're growing in a different way. Um, it's what it's actually shown me is that we are we can look UK wide rather than just a catchment area of Birmingham. So we had lots of customers coming in from places like Stourbridge and uh, you know Wolverhampton, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because we're right by the train station in the um, jewelry quarter. But actually, with our online products, our customer base becomes UK focused. So I think it's I just it's really difficult question to ask I think if we're looking at phys- the physical space people are still very cautious and, and I understand that and I think it will depend entirely what happens in the winter how you know whether there's going to be a big second wave all of those things is going to affect confidence but I hope I'm I think this year is in terms of turnover I think it is pretty much a write-off um but we have to kind of you know we have to remain positive and I'm seeing you know people want to go out they want the bar industry to work they want hospitality to be here and people are prepared to support but then there's on the flip side I don't ever want to make someone feel like they have to come and when they certainly don't feel ready to so I I, th- I think you know I'm writing off this year this financial year is just we'll, we'll kind of if we can get through it we'll get through it rather than having any kind of high hopes and then maybe next financial year we start looking at kind of growth and and sort of I would say getting back to normal but I'm not sure that's ever going to happen so but yeah, more confidence, I would say. The way that you're trying to adapt is 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 is, is impressive and refreshing. Um, but what what top tips would you have for other SMEs in your sector who are listening and perhaps trying to work out how they can still succeed despite all this uncertainty? Um, sure. So I think the big thing um, is that we started really looking at what our customers were doing and behaving, and I saw a lot of our there's a big um, big whiskey community on Twitter. And I realised just how many of the uh, of my customers were, were starting to go to tasting events that were run by lots of other clubs and lots of other bars around the country. So that kind of gave me the idea that, right, we now need to think UK focus. So we just started li- literally and asking people as well. We did a big survey of, our, of some of our regulars just to kind of figure out what they were finding because their consumer habits have changed without probably without them really thinking about it. They've just the world has opened up a little bit more. And I think for. SMEs in the bar I mean everyone like I remember when we first looked at doing delivery we couldn't get you know a a glass bottle for a cocktail for love nor money Um, and that took about two months just to kind of order so I know that lots of other kind of companies of my size and and doing what we do are are looking at delivery but I would say and you know bottling cocktails and and so on I would say that that should be part of a long-term strategy especially around Christmas Um, I think a lot of people are looking at it as a stopgap, but I don't think there's any reason why that can't become part of your normal offering. Um, And then I would say also look to other sectors. And and I always find great kind of inspiration in looking at other sectors to see what they're doing. I think, you know, you you can't grow unless you sort of look out and look for, you know, what, I don't know, other, other companies do, you know, who are operating in a slightly different way. Look what they're doing. Um, that's always given me great inspiration and then I just think for any kind of owners out there it's just I think the nature of business and owning your own business is about always adapting and pivoting I think my my team get thoroughly sick of me because I'll we'll do something and then I'll be like oh no that's not gonna <laughs> we have to just start it all again so I don't I'm not a believer in being static and um, you know never you know this I think it comes from the tech world it's you know build test learn and I think that that can apply to any sector so it's is it good enough for now great can we build on it in the future yes you know not being afraid to change and to kind of and to you know to grow that way as well one of the other things that I I I, uh, took on a couple of years ago I actually um, did the Aston small business course uh, aimed at SMEs and that was I think going back to the learnings from that has actually also been really helpful so the course material and and also the um the emails that we get and the advice from uh directly from Aston I think has been has been actually kind of invaluable and a lot of the things that I've done and and, and the growth uh, that I have taken on over the last few years has, has become has come directly from from doing that course so I think yeah looking out for those those kind of learning opportunities um, is also uh, a, a great thing to do. Amy Seaton the founder and owner operator of the Whiskey Club many thanks for sharing your experiences with Aston Means Business today. Thanks very much.
Professor Mark Hart was listening to my interview with Amy Seaton, and he joins us again online now. Uh, Mark, the lockdown was catastrophic for the hospitality sector, reducing revenues by 95% in the case of the Whiskey Club. Yes, revenues have fallen away, but Amy has found a way, found a way of keeping the brand alive. And I think that's the same challenge that all business owners have at the moment is not letting your customers forget you. And they're never finding a way of doing things online, which perhaps, um, you know, had not been, you know, had really been thought of before. So, you know, Amy has really been quite innovative in ways in which she's, again, kept the brand alive in people's minds. That, you know, the club will be there. But, you know, a club does not necessarily have to have a physical presence in the city centre. It's always nice to drop in for a glass of tasting or whatever. But, um, you know, the club is a membership and, it's important to think of your membership at this time. And I think that's exactly what Amy has done. She's put her thinking cap on. And, you know, it's, um, you know, the, her good good days will come again. As well as the local audience, of course, she seems to have gotten a UK-wide customer base. And I've said to business owners over, over the years, and they've never believed me, now they do, I think. You know, when you once you put your, your, your business on a website, you're global. And you'll never know who will come across you. I mean, everyone's been doing things differently in lockdown, you know, searching for stuff online and coming across some very funky niche stuff. I think the key point is that, you know, it, it, suddenly people are got a bit more time in their hands. They're looking for ways in which they can get their favorite brands or try new stuff. And I think that's suddenly, you know, become part of what Amy has had to think about. Her challenge, of course, is now to think about a different set of customers, she had the club. She had people dropping in, not always membership of the club because it's not a it's not a closed uh, club in that sense. Um, and now she's having to think about customers from all over the place, and I think that's brilliant. Um, so uh, you know, when I said to Amy when she was in the classroom back in the day when we had um, teaching uh, on campus that you know think of think of how big your business could be, think of your geographical reach, and now suddenly with a lockdown and a public health crisis, it's landed right in her lap and she's having to react to that but it will create different challenges for her about how she then looks after those those customers the key the key thing steve for me is that amy doesn't see it as a temporary thing that she doesn't think oh well once we get locked down over and once the crisis um you know begins to evaporate that you know i'll go back to to where i was in birmingham she mustn't think that way she's got to realize that you know i'm scaling my business now i'm taking this to a place where i can really begin to punch well above my weight one thing I listened to when, mm. when Amy was speaking was how finance has been a challenge. I think her point about business rates and the grants available is a very valid one whereby she wasn't eligible because of, sh- of shared ad- addresses. I think that's something, again, which, you know, when, that's easy to criticise government, but, uh, you know, in, in the, many ways they have to react quickly and get things up and running and therefore to give these grants and then suddenly realise, ah, OK, that won't cover every business at that premise. Someone's got to get the money. Um, so it's up to landlords then to do the decent thing. But, you know, it, it was a bit of a sort of a hammer to, to crack open a peanut, I guess. But I think that she's been able to access other forms of support, which have been really important for her. Um, and, I, and I think that that's what the government should also continue to think about. You know, I've made this point in many contexts now that um, we should not be thinking of wrapping up all the business support. Um, these sectors which have experienced basically revenues dropping to zero overnight because of the lockdown, they need support and to get them back on their feet again. And, you know, many of these businesses are going profitable concerns and and they need every support that they can get. And when I say government, I'm talking about the whole range of of government activity from, you know, the grants to local authority and stuff like that. At the moment, there's a lot of underspend and Treasury wants it back. Well, I would say, no, don't hand it back. Local government knows its business is best. Let them hold on to the money and see if they can come up with even better schemes, um, which are more suited to the needs of their local sectors. And hospitality in Birmingham is one of them. And Amy's business is is a classic example of that. The government has now launched the Small Business Leadership Programme, which is being run by business schools nationally. And I think that's a very important contribution um, to the recovery process. So the Aston Small Business Programme, will continue, of course it will, but also you've got a national programme now backed by government, which will get many, many, many more hundreds of businesses through it, and it will be on the same principles as the Aston Small Business Programme. So 
it's really important that these programs are, are developed and made available to as many small business owners as possible at this time. Thank you, Mark, for joining us on this episode. Well, it was good to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks once again to Mark Hart, the Professor of Small Business and Entrepreneurship at Aston Business School, and to entrepreneur Amy Seaton. She's the founder and director of the Whiskey Club here in Birmingham. We'll be back soon with another case study of how businesses are adapting to the pandemic and with more crucial analysis and advice from academics and experts here at Aston. Aston means business. SMEs adapting to COVID-19 challenges. Thanks for listening.